Hi, welcome to Engineering Mechanics. Today we are going to talk about springs and dashboards and other models of mechanical behavior. My name is Arun Srinivasa and I am a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Okay, so let's talk uh, about what is meant by a model and what are these laws. All of engineering is based on creating models and joining them together in some complicated way. Okay, so it doesn't matter what we do, almost all of the way in which we think is think in terms of them. Now, generally speaking, people have a misunderstanding about what is meant by a model in the engineering context. Typically, we think model means uh, a miniature representation of something. And I want to tell you that's not what we mean. So that's not what do we, what we mean. What do we mean? It's a symbolic representation of the behavior of an object usually an idealization or a cartoon so we will exaggerate the behavior and ignore um, most of the other things just like a cartoon okay so that is the idea of a model and that's what we are going to talk about okay now we have already done some of these things in our previous classes so let's talk about some of the things that you're already familiar with and some of the new things we are going to talk about okay so let's talk about uh, the, how do we decide uh, how to model something it starts out with asking question number one. What behavior do we uh, want to represent? And this is very high in Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy because we have to be able to identify these kinds of behaviors. Then the next question is, what do we want to quantify? Ultimately, all of mathematics is about quantities in some way or the other. If you cannot quantify the behavior, it's not possible to convert it into numbers which can be represented. Okay, so that's a very key thing. And this quantification is called a degree of freedom, the way in which it can change or something like that or a state variable. And it's pretty high in Bloom's taxonomy. Question number three, how does the behavior change with time? That's what we are interested in. So something was fine until yesterday and it broke today. That was an abrupt change with time or something gradually moves like your car or something like that. That's another kind of change of time. Usually, this is represented by algebraic or differential equations. Not always, but usually this is a good chance. There are other ways of doing it, but it will be some kind of algebraic equation, maybe depending upon past history. Okay. Now, getting this algebraic or differential equation is quite high in Bloom's taxonomy. And that's actually why in a mechanical engineering curriculum, you are taught how to do differential equations and so on because of uh, this idea. Okay. Now, first model is rigid body. What the heck is a rigid body? There is no real rigid body. What it represents is a very stiff object that retain their shape no matter what you do to them. Okay, so they can move about. So here is a rigid body and it can move about this way, that way, this way. So by the way, if it goes this way, it's called swaying. If it goes this way, it's called heaving. And if it goes forward and backward, it's called surging. So those are three different ways in which it can move, up, move about. And then it has three different ways in which, in which it can rotate. If it does like that, it's called pitching. If it does like that, it's called yaw. And if it does like this, it's called roll. So there are six different ways in which it can move. Three of them moving about, three of them uh, changing its orientation. Okay, that's how it works. Also, rigid bodies are repositories of linear momentum and angular momentum. We will come back to this at a later stage. So they have two properties. One is how they can move. Another one is what can what can they store? Okay. So uh, we have three variables which represent uh, moving up and down, sideways, this, that, and the other, uh, uh, surge, heave, and uh, sway, and then three rotations: roll, pitch, and yaw. Okay. So those are six things that we are going to represent for rigid bodies. We'll come back to this a little bit later. That's model number one. We already saw that. Model number two, we already saw ideal connectors. Okay, things like pin joints, this, that, and the other. That's another model. They represent all or nothing behavior. What do we mean by that? They allow free motion in some ways, but completely prevent them in others. That's a second kind of model. Okay, they are key for reducing degrees of freedom in a controlled manner, and we use them all the time in a very clever way for building all kinds of things. So, if we continue, so what it means for a connector is that some forces and some moment components are zero, some components of displacements and rotations are zero. We saw that already, right? So the sum of all of them should add up to six. So it may be 
two force components and three displacement com i mean four displacement components are zero that will give that will give us uh, six that kind of thing okay the other non zero ones you cannot know a priori you have to use newton's laws to find them that's how it works okay the zero ones we will know a priori we can we can set them to zero the non zero ones you have to solve by using newton's laws that's how ideal connectors work okay now we we'll look at the two major types of models i'm sorry there is a typo so what are the types first one is things that store and give back flywheels inertial masses springs capacitors things like that the second kind of things is that which will, will, will convert mechanical work into heat dashpots resistors dry friction elements so on and so forth okay so those are the two major ideas that we have for models we already saw some examples of the first kind we will also look at some examples of the second kind okay now that we have an idea on this let's look at the first kind of model which is a spring and by the way don't think of them as a literal spring it represents the springiness of bodies okay what the heck do we mean by springiness that those are bodies that will deform so for example here is a springy body notice it's not a rigid body because it's kind of flexible but it has a very interesting property if you apply if you pull it it will deform but if you let go it will come back to its original shape almost instantly right it always remembers one shape right it is able to store a shape and recover it and we use it for that purpose okay so the main thing from a modeling point of view is that the pull force of a spring is a function of the difference between current length and free length notice i did not say f equal to kx please eliminate that from your head if you do that if you remember f equal to kx you won't know what is f you won't know what is k you won't know what is x and then everything is a confusion so i told you please remember these things by verbal versions so it says the pull force of a spring is a function of the difference between current length and free length what do i mean by this so here is a spring and i'm not applying any force to it i'm just holding it and the length of the spring when i'm just holding it without applying any force is called the free length so this is free length right now when i pull it you can see it got much longer and the difference in the original the the current length and the free length is what tells me how much force i'm applying for a particular kind of spring called a linear spring the full pull force is proportional to the l minus l not okay by the way notice that we always talk about pull force as if we are pulling don't worry about what happens if you are pushing because you pretend it's pulling automatically the pull force will become negative if it is pushing so notice the pull force on the hand is that way it's pulling the hand the pull force on the spring is this way this is a very important idea so don't forget that okay so for springs i have drawn the pull forces on the springs so for an ideal spring algebraic value of the pull force is a function of current length minus unstretched or free length okay so f is proportional to l minus l not don't forget that okay direction of the pull force on the spring is pointing outward can you see that that's that and it doesn't matter if this number turns out to be negative i'll still draw the arrow outside and do the other one okay by newton's third law the force on my hand the pull force on my hand will be pointing into the spring that's how it works so one thing is pulling out the other one is pulling that way so notice everything is written as if it is pulling okay so that's what a spring is now our next idea is a dashpot now this is more unfamiliar to you than a spring so let me show you what it is it represents resistance to sliding so it takes an effort or force to keep the body sliding so for example here is this uh, dashpot and i have to push it hard before it will slide 
I, I hope you can see that. I'm pushing, pushing. It's hard to push. And then the harder I push, the more it slides, the faster it slides. But if I stop it, it will stay that way. I have to push harder to go. It will not recover back. That's the dashboard. Its resistance will change with the applied force. Okay. Body slides as long as the force is present. As soon as the force is removed, the sliding stops. That's how it works. That's a dashboard. And in this case, look at the symbol for it. It's a box in which things are sliding. And the idea is the sliding rate, the algebraic value of the pull force, that's this guy, is proportional to the sliding rate. Don't think it's the velocity. Because if I take this dashboard and run with it, you will not get any pull force. So even though it has velocity, it has to slide. It is sliding velocity, not just absolute velocity. Okay, That's a very important point. So algebraic value of the pull force is a function of the sliding rate. Direction of pull force on the spring is pointing outward along the dashboard. That's the direction of the pull force. By Newton's third law, directions of pull force on the hand will be opposite and will be pointing into the dashboard. So pretend it's always pulling and the force is proportional to the sliding rate. If the sliding rate is negative, then the force will be negative. Don't worry about it. That's why I did not say magnitude. I only said algebraic value. Okay. Allow algebra to help you with it. So pretend whenever we are doing a dashboard or a spring, we always pretend it's always pulling. And then we'll let the signs take care of themselves. That's why checking the signs is very, very important. Okay. That's how it works. So you don't have to guess whether it's pulling or pushing. You just pretend it's pulling and let sign, let algebra take care of it. Okay. That's a dashboard. The last item which we're going to talk about is dry friction. This represents stickiness of objects. Doesn't mean that it's stuck. It just means it's sticky. Okay. Sticky objects have dry friction. And this, unfortunately, the stickiness is very tricky. It has some features like a connector and some features that are uh, not quite like a connector. Okay. First thing is for this, the magnitude of the shearing or sliding force can be anything up to a critical value. can be anything up to a critical value. Okay, The direction of the shear force always prevents sliding. So those are the two things you have to remember. The magnitude of the shear force can be anything. The direction of the shear force always prevents sliding. Notice that it doesn't say is opposite to the velocity. That's not what it is. It has to prevent sliding. It has to enforce stickiness. That's how it works. Okay, So we have looked at the three major items springs, dashboards, and dry friction, apart from the other ones, it turns out we can do a lot with just the, you know, with just the items that we saw. There are two videos that go along with this. One shows you how this uh, different degrees of freedom of a rigid body works. I would urge you to watch it. The second one represents how dry friction works and why it is very, very important. This is an awesome video, both of them. You have to watch them. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.